Hey guys, welcome to the third episode of the show Community Currencies Now, where we will be highlighting different projects within the field of blockchain technology and community currencies and kind of see how those two empower each other uh, within the different projects. Uh, the original intro for today got goofed up, so I just wanted to make a new one really quick just to kind of introduce the project for today, which will be Will Roddick from Grassroots Economics which is a non-profit foundation working mostly in Kenya, uh, but definitely in Africa, to, uh, to empower smaller and marginalized communities who may have different uh, difficulties regarding their currency. So they're kind of creating some new community currencies to empower those communities. So yeah, th I think it was a pretty interesting episode. Will is definitely a smart guy and I had some problems picking up on everything all the time. But uh, I think this could definitely be uh, an episode in which you can learn a lot. Definitely uh, if you're a veteran as well, because I think it was pretty high level. But uh, yeah, enjoy the episode, guys, and let's get into it. Hey, everybody. Hey, Anton. Hey, so, well, just straight off the bat, I would like to just get to know you a little bit better. Maybe you could tell us about your journey towards this project and about the kind of the philosophy behind it and how you started it. Sure. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I, I was a physicist for many years back in the US and um, I got introduced to econophysics and agent-based modeling uh, was kind of what I did in physics and started doing modeling around economics uh, after reading some of the works of like Bernard Leotard and, um, and some other professors that were studying economics at the time. and. Um, and I just got really excited about it. I loved the idea and it seemed like just such a missing link that, you know, we spend our lives focused on money and I didn't feel like I really understood what it was. And I think generally we don't. Um, yeah, I can relate to and, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so just playing around with some of parameterizations around currency and simulations for me was just a big eye opener that, oh, wow, you know, like if we made conscious decisions around currency or other types of financial instruments that we could really uh, change the world in a lot of beautiful ways. Um, and so um, I started studying a lot of the community currencies that I found around the U.S., um, like Berkshire, Berkshire's, for instance, and um, also went abroad a bit and studied um, like the work of Community Forge. And um, I, you know, in long distance, I, I got to uh, interact a bit with the Bancos Palmas and studied some historical examples like Curitiba and Brazil and um, was just really inspired by everything that was out there and wanted to start, you know, experiencing that and learning more. And uh, I found it, it was really hard in the States um, to introduce something like that. And um, one of the ideas was, was that, uh, or the feelings was that, you know, people where I was living anyways, I lived in a commune at the time, but money wasn't really an obstacle. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't um, treated as such and building something like a community currency wasn't really um, interesting to anybody that I knew. And, uh, <laughs> and so I started getting more and more interested in the idea of development work and um, going abroad and finding places where, people didn't have enough money. And I, I mean, I did some work with engineers without borders and like Pine Ridge reservation. And, um, eventually I, uh, I asked to go to China with the, with the U S peace corps as a, as a volunteer. And I got, ended up being sent to Kenya, uh, instead and, um, ended up here and, um, yeah, just, I learned Swahili. I fell in love with the place, um, and people and, um, basically I've just called it my home for the last 13 years and I have a Kenyan daughter and she goes to school here and um, yeah finding finding places where money was chronically lacking and yet there was lots of goods and services to trade um, is kind of all over here all the time and I think you know in to some degree it's also in the US um, it was just harder for me to see it back then and also harder to organize around it. Um, and so here in Kenya, um, I started a foundation called grassroots economics and, uh, with the, with the goal of kind of trying to combat marginalization of communities due to 
the lack of a financial instrument that they could use. And um, I did a lot of work kind of going into the history of um, colonialism and imperialist money systems here and how they changed, how people were reciprocal with each other and what were some of the older methods that were used. And um, a lot of the early days of, of working here was just um, showing people videos and trying to create connections between existing community currencies around the world and just saying, look, uh, here's what's happened in Bancos Palmas. Here's a video, you know, is this possible here? You know, could we design something like that? Um, and, uh, and so, you know, working with community groups, uh, groups of businesses and elders in communities and chiefs and, um, and, and, coming up with a design we first started with um one called ecopesa and that was like back mm -hmm. in 2010 and uh, these were all of paper vouchers and um they uh it, originally the for the first ones that we did we we had them backed with national currency and so we would issue them out for events um they would circulate among the local business network the business network would actually throw the events these would be like a waste collection in informal settlements and tree planting and stuff and then they would slowly by slowly like there was an amount that they could redeem for the national currency every month and uh and that was it until they were all redeemed and that was the end of the program it wasn't meant to be a you know a permanent fixture in any way it was just to see like well is this possible how much secondary circulation would there be and we had a bunch of grad students helping to like measure we had like you know little serial numbers and we tried to like actually see how many we had a little spending journals and whatnot see how much secondary circulation there was and generally everyone really liked the program it was fun it was sort of a, a way a safe way for me to sort of, sort of test out the concept and willingness of people and community to like kind of co-design and then um after that um we and and we at that point we had a, a little small community-based organization called koru at the time and um it, there was just a few of us kind of volunteering uh, to work on that and uh, these were you know a bunch of um, kenyans that i had met through the peace corps and uh we started bangla Pesa was the next one and uh, that one was um instead of having it backed by uh shillings it was backed by agreement and uh, in the form of a credit obligation and basically the the businesses in the community would come together they would all accredit each other with 400 shillings worth back then of these vouchers and we would print denominations of them and they, we did all the security printing and um and uh, that started to flow around quite well um in the community we would also i mean they people would there was an in-group selling it or trading it amongst each other and then there were sort of out group people who were not issuers um, that would, you know, accept it, uh, you know, usually as a percentage of some of their goods or services, right? So someone that wasn't yeah. an issuer of it, they didn't have anything to begin with, but they might accept a little bit. And then there was a guarantee that they could spend it back within the business network. And that was fairly clear and simple. And that sort of concept of creating a service commons where a bunch of people come together, uh, create commitments, legal commitments against uh, their services and create a voucher redeemable as payment for their services. That's been basically the form that uh, we've been working on with various degrees of that since, you know, now almost 10 years. And um, I mean, we've had, we went into digital at one point and we got to a point where we could only make one kind of digital voucher. So we ended up in a little bit more of like a Sardex esque situation where everyone had one digital voucher for a while um almost like a year and a half and then just you know as of like this year we finally are able to now create individual digital vouchers again and so that's that's been really exciting and we've just you know we've been seeing i'm, I'm actually writing a mid-year report right now and we've you know we're up to you know from 100 trades a day up to like 500 trades a day right now we've created wow. 30 different currencies just in the last month and we have a backlog of about another 60. So we'll probably reach 100 by the end of the year. And so we've just made it a bit more turnkey on how a community can create these 
and we have the beginning of like a certification process right now we send out trainers um and they go through a whole bunch of games um and um and those games kind of educate them on how to create their system and then they create a a legal form that represents their their commitments and their currency and that's audited by local authorities so there's a mediation process as well if there's any disputes and so they're creating a you know a legal credit obligation as a group we'd call that a mutual credit um, it's all positive number based. It's not, um, you know, there's no like positive and negative. Everyone's given a certain amount of credit by the group. Um, mm-hmm. and, and they're spending it and there's a whole bunch of rules, you know, in terms of like how the group tracks high and low balances. So if people are low and others are high, they'll meet on a regular basis and try to, um, do settlement. All right. <clears throat> so just to recap yeah. real quick, Will, <laughs> to make sure yeah. I'm with you and everybody else's. So yeah. I guess you have all these different villages, right? And Mm -hmm. I guess you could say there's kind of a liquidity problem with their native currency, right? Yeah, well, I mean, they've got goods and services, yeah, and and they they, there's an illiquid market on trading those goods and services. So the national currency is just not available, or when it is, it's only available during certain months of the year, and so you end up with these kind of bust-boom cycles all the time. Yeah, okay. And then you mentioned how you have you said I think you said over 30 different currencies now right does that mean every village or like region gets its own currency that they can use to kind of become self-sufficient or can a currency also be like uh, some kind of commodity or like you know like things that they grow or like different goods yeah so so the currencies what we do now I mean we used to actually say that they were denominated in the national currency and what we've done now is we've created a whole kind of legal framework around it and and we don't we don't want to make them to say they're denominated national currency is technically okay but it it is confusing for people because they often think that they're backed by national currency Uh, instead of denominated and so we what we do now is there's a standard market rate that the communities will decide in national currency but that is a secondary market the primary market and what they're denominated in is decided on by each community so a community and and by community i mean a group of issuers they come together as an association of members together they have a name they create a name for their voucher and that voucher is denominated let's say in eggs okay for example we've got a whole bunch of them i'm about to uh, like put this list on our blog so you can see like there's some that are denominated in like Roco clubs, bananas, water, um, all kinds of stuff. And um, so so they, they say, okay, we're denominating that. And then the value of it, they'll say one of these, for instance, equals one banana or one Roco cube. And there's a market rate, right, which is like 10 shillings. They're roughly standardized around 10 shillings. But that that can change, I mean, uh, relative to, you know, the the price of a banana, but they're backed by the banana in this case. And the community group will use them um, on par with a banana, which is roughly 10 shillings, for instance. So there's basically an equivalency between all the currencies. They're all roughly 10 shillings, but they're backed by individual services or commodities. We we tend to push toward the, the term service. Even if you're selling tomatoes, we'd say it's the service of providing the tomato. It's not the tomato itself. Um, that it's that it's denominated in yeah all right that makes sense Does that make sense? That makes and then sense. we also have a voucher that we issue as grassroots economics foundation that's called sarafu and so sarafu we and anyone who uses our interfaces our digital interface and we have a ussd one and we're working on a web version um like a flutter app um we give five sarafu out to everyone and that's sort of a training token but we also accept it back for currency creation processes so they pay us for the training and creation of their voucher and auditing and support. We have a phone support team. And so we take a hundred vouchers, a hundred Sarafu when they start, we, really they're just giving those back to us. And we also accept a hundred Sarafu yearly to, to maintain the interface and, and phone support for them. All right. right. So we have our own voucher. Yeah. yeah. But then you have, you have the Sarafu, right? Which is kind of a, mm-hmm. more like a currency in the way that we usually understand it. And then you have these other currencies, which can be like a banana, potato, so on, right? Can I can can I use the yeah. Sarafu to like buy a digital potato and then buy a real potato? And then it's all like kind of 
on the blockchain or how does that work digitally is it all digital now or do you have yeah. them physical as well the vouchers yeah. no they're they're all digital now and okay. um and and just to mention on serafu it's it's we declare it as a voucher just the same way a community would would right so we say a hundred vouchers a hundred of these serafu is equal to one a voucher deployment process that's a service we offer right yeah. so it is a voucher backed in our services so it's not any more or less a currency than uh, any other uh, community currency on the network um, and uh, and so just to be clear yeah um, I mean the fact that we do give it out freely I mean we're a nonprofit foundation we're not trying to make a profit on this we're trying to use it as an education tool but people will maybe see it as a more generally used medium of exchange versus a, a, you know in a village they might say well this is used in this village but I wouldn't necessarily use it in the next village and so right now it's a, the interface is a multi-token or multi-voucher wallet that exists on on a ussd so it's a text-based interface and you can change which voucher you're using right let's say i have five vouchers i could decide to trade those with whomever and if people want to exchange one voucher for another that is totally voluntary there's no sort of obligation to do so um and so that'll happen in some some cases and that that's some some of the stuff that we're working on moving forward is i mean we have experimented a lot i mean all of these are on a blockchain so we've created our own blockchain called kitabu which means a book or a ledger in swahili and we've got about eight nodes i think right now running this around the world um and what's on that blockchain are these legal agreements right so each voucher is specified they have a demurrage as well. The demurrage goes into a community fund that's voted on by each community. So there's a bunch of specifications on what, what is this voucher, who's backing it, um, you know, what's it backed by, all that stuff. There's no volatility in the sense where, you know, uh, algorithmic volatility like you would see in the crypto world, right? So I, I, in some ways, I don't think of these as cryptocurrencies, although cryptography is involved because there's public and private keys. Um, but essentially, it's just a distributed database that is holding the information about accounts and the instruments themselves like the vouchers yeah so you could say it's related to the blockchain but not in the general cryptocurrency sense that we usually are used to yeah, yeah. I mean, in some ways it's just coming up with standards on uh financial instruments right yeah. so we're basically saying like if you want to issue a cryptocurrency or, or a voucher then there are some standards around that. In other words, you shouldn't, for instance, over issue more than a, you're certified to over issue. So for instance, if I'm issuing tomato vouchers as a community group, well, how many tomatoes are there? <clears throat> Is there someone that can witness that? Um, I, I've got a few slides that'd probably be good to go through. Yeah, sure. Actually, yeah, because I, I, I was wondering I about that as well. When you kind of introduce the system to a new village, for example, how do you go about yeah. creating the right values within the system for example in terms of how many tomatoes are there you know yeah well i'll skim through these pretty quickly here so community yeah. inclusion currencies this is you know th this is the effect of a good voucher in our sort of articulation of this right and a voucher is a really like a credit obligation it's a trust instrument it can become used as a currency but initially it's really just about the trust of the issuer Right, or issuers, right? Inclusion because we want everyone to be involved and community because that's that's the core focus of, of creating and, and uh, supporting communities. Um, you know, this is this is a, t a typical like women's group who are trading goods and services with each other when they didn't have national currency. This is during COVID. Um, this, I, you know, I'll share, I'll share the link to this later. We don't have to get super into it now, but just talking about, you know, what is the difference between various imperialistic monetary systems and an economic commons? What does that yeah, look like? That's great. Uh, yeah, um, this is just some history around. This is what our team looks like in Kenya. We've got a few other programmers here that are not here, but a few of these are computer programmers and the rest are field officers and phone support teams. Right. So we do a lot of, you know, field training and then phone support. Um, super important. Um, this is kind of the general process, um, kind of very simplified, is that you have service providers like in a community that's here. This would be like your community group. They are creating a legal credit obligation in the form of a voucher. They're recording it on a ledger <clears throat> that gives everyone accounts. Right. And then we have witnesses that validate um, or certify 
that these vouchers are indeed backed by actual goods and services, right? So the witnessing and validation part is a really big deal. <clears throat> it's a little bit in some ways like your blue tick on Twitter, um, but it basically also means that we, based on this validation, we will put these vouchers on our interfaces, right? Because any, this is a public ledger, but technically anyone can create a, an instrument on this ledger, but we're not going to put them on our interfaces unless they pass some sort of uh, due diligence, right? Um, creating exchanges and, you know, liquidity pools and all this kind of stuff that we plan to do a lot more of in the future. A lot of it is dependent on how good are these vouchers. And so having data to back up, you know, that's, you know, volume, transparent data that we can see on the blockchain to say, if this is, if this, if someone wants to invest or co-vest into a community or a commons here, can they hold some of the utility of that community? What does that look like? What kind of information would they have? And, and how would they be able to push those things onto other markets um, regionally and, 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 um, and whatnot? So I'll, I'll touch back on that in a minute. Um, yeah. this, is, this is one year of trade data. This is a visualization done by Thomas Fleischmann. We had about 60,000 users at the time. This is around COVID. Um, and about $3 million worth of transactions over that year. And we had some RCTs, like randomized control trials, like a, you know, surveys and studies done to show that we had about a 5x trade multiplier within two months in a lot of wow. these communities because their markets had just stag stagnated. Yeah, that's um, awesome. So we do a lot of data visualization, anonymized stuff. Um, this is what the interface looks like uh, right now. Um, it's just a text thing. You dial this and you get a little text. It, it works on any phone in the country. You don't need internet at all. You put in a pin. That's your pin for your account. So you're you're your private key on the blockchain is locked and encrypted to this pin and your phone number, right? So um, it's not, you know, it, it's not the end all be all for crypto for people who want to like manage their own private keys, but you can send off of this interface. Oh, here's a send transaction. This would be for Serafu here, but you could change your voucher here to be any, any voucher that you want to use. Um, you're just sending by phone number, right? To whom so you're sending to. You won't even you're need to putting have it a in the smartphone. Yeah. Like you can no, just, you don't it's just a, a text phone. message. Oh, that's pretty cool. Cause one of the questions I wanted to ask you was yeah. about the, like the technological barriers in this project, yeah. but I guess yeah. they aren't really there then. <laughs> well, they are because, because these systems like to set them up. I mean, we're doing this in Cameroon and South Africa right now. And to make this work with the local telecom is expensive. Okay. And so we're paying okay. and we're, we're getting this subsidized by the humanitarian space right now to pay for this, but we're paying on the order of one cent or up to two cents per transaction or per, per usage of these menus. And it's similar to an SMS, but you get it. It's actually a dynamic menu. It's not an SMS. Um, it, it's sort of like 20 SMSs, if you will, but it's, it's all done within one uh, session. Right. So this is, and then, yeah. and then both parties after the transaction get an SMS back. So each USSD interaction also for, if it's a transaction involves two SMSs. So the cost of this entire session right here can be as much as, you know, two shillings or two, uh, two cents on the dollar. Okay. Yeah. okay. And so, so setting that up in other countries, it, it's just, it's even more expensive than Kenya. I mean, we're just, we're doing it in Cameroon right now in South Africa, but it's not, you know, to really scale it out, it's very hard to work with the telecom so far, and they're just super expensive. Um, they've gone down. It used to be 10 shillings, you know, when we, and we <laughs> couldn't do it before. And they lowered it down to like one, around one shilling. We're like, okay, you know, let's let's see if, you know, will the Red Cross support this? Would World Food Program support this? And, you know, by showing this data and, you know, how much food has been transferred, and we can basically tick off a lot of what humanitarian space actors want to see in terms of impacts, right? And yeah. they can do their surveys on the ground and double check and, you know, double check the data, look at the blockchain and, you know, ensure no one's tampered with the data, right? So there's a lot here in terms of just impacts that uh, are, are super valuable. And so the cost of running this, <clears throat> you know, over a year in, in Kenya, you know, it's, it's going to be, you know, just on the paying the telecom part, it's going to be, you know, a few thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars, and, and these guys are not paying us anything, right? The we don't charge anything for these services, um, and so the idea of having, um, you know, we're starting to, in the sense of the Serafu, um, you know, having them have a subscription fee for a lot of the services we're providing, 
but that's going to be very targeted toward, I mean, you know, the paying clients for a lot of this stuff will be, you know, uh, higher end social enterprises and still humanitarian actors and different sorts of actors. And we, you know, the goal is to always be able to offer this as free services to, you know, marginalized communities and vulnerable populations. Like we're working in refugee camps and, and whatnot. Um, this, this is sort of some of the exercises we do. Like this is what it looks like in the community is a lot of like, th these are exercises that like I saw from like um, Edgar Kahn who did time banks back in the day. And um, it's just a way of visualizing how is your community connected? What is the, what is the social fabric? You know, how abundant are you as a community and how do you already interact with each other? And I have seen these exercises do so much good regardless of the community currency that I think that they're great. I just, I really, really enjoy working with the community to just explore their own abundance because often they don't realize it. They don't realize how connected and how abundant they really are. Um, and so the, the currency in a way is just, is sort of tracking this path, you know, like what, what is going on here? How are we uh, supporting each other? How are we resilient? And then we go into uh, games with beans. So we do a lot of like role plays with beans and inventories and we play through, you know, I'll do this online with some groups. We have a little jam board here um, where you can like actually start trading with one another and, and think through, uh, you know, what, what is that? What does that look like? Um, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And I guess I, it I'm also just, helps uh, the uh, bonds between yeah. the, the communities themselves as well, right? I'd imagine it gives them yeah, sort of a yeah. connection. Yeah, yeah, that's that's been sort of the biggest lesson from a lot of this is that if you if you start with a community that has lots of trust already, this process accelerates much much faster, like twenty x the speed. And if you start with a community that's not in trust with each other and doesn't have, there's no community groups, there's no you know uh, gatherings and stuff like that. It's it, you know you're starting in a way from a uh, a dearth of trust and these are really built on trust and they help accelerate those sort of trusted relationships um so that's it's just a huge thing and i mean we have seen them actually grow trust we've done some measurements and studies around that um but it is it is really something to look at it's a little bit like we also do work with permaculture i'll, I'll i can skip forward to that a little bit but oh, yeah like we do work with agroforestry a lot too and like when you're starting a agroforestry plot or permaculture plot if you're starting on sand it's going to take five to ten years right if if you're starting on good soil and rains it, it you know these processes of you know building networks in the soil happen much 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 faster and that's that's very true with community groups as well like if this is this would be a woman's group uh typically and if they're not you know if if they're in a, a bad relationship already with each other it's really hard and so you know what we've built into and we're trying to build even more into our process and trainings is reconciliation peace building you know how do you even have discussions as a group of businesses or a group of members of a community when there has been conflict when there has been you know all kinds of things you know break breakages of trust um it's super super important and i think the community currencies you know it's a good tool that shows you know uh, the missing network as well you know it's sort of a litmus test or a die in the water um but yeah um i here i was going to just mention that like vouchers are totally normal and they're all over the world like it, um it, telecom companies issue vouchers right which they call airtime credit that's redeemable for their service of talking on the phone right it, they're all around us and the legal frameworks around them are fairly clear in every country in the world and so that's why we've really we've stepped far far back from calling these currencies and we say no they're just vouchers and yeah a voucher can act like a currency and there there's a legal precedent for you know being able to trade something like a voucher which is also very similar to an invoice right a tradable invoice if i yeah. give you a hundred dollars and you owe me tomatoes i can take that invoice and give it to someone else and you'll give him the tomatoes um so so that's that's something that really relaxes a lot of you know we've done huge amounts of legal due diligence it's been very simple to explain um and so that's been nice and then so in working with the red cross and all these other humanitarian organizations they also use vouchers it's actually fairly common for them and so for them to to use a voucher from the community that they're trying to help 
is, is one way of actually building the capacity of that community to help themselves and their neighbors around them. So they'll go into a village and say, look, uh, you've already got these vouchers created, wonderful. Can we use some of those? Um, and we'll build your capacity. We'll, you know, we'll help you as a community to grow your service provision, but we want to use your vouchers now to help these refugees outside your community. And we want to see that they circulate and reciprocate within the community. And so it's a really, it's an obvious and simple thing for the humanitarian organizations to say, well, we already used vouchers in the past. They would use these things like aid vouchers, which would be like single use, you know, from a distributor. But instead, if they can look at these as vouchers and say, oh yeah, cool. You know, we can, we use these as vouchers just as we did before. And we get a lot of data. We get to be able to track the results and we can, this can stay here long-term. It's not just an in and out thing. These can be, you know, these can be endogenous instruments that come from the community. So that's been really beautiful. And it's been a big change for how a lot of these organizations operate in Kenya and starting in Cameroon right now. Um, and how they approach development instead of just dumping national currency on a community, they they're invested in a way into or co-vested into that growth of the service industry that is helping, you know, uh, create sustainable local economies. Yeah. yeah, that's really awesome. And it sounds like the introduction of or like the evolution of this financial system is really helping other things than just the financial system, like the communities themselves. That's really awesome. Yeah. But well, I wanted to yeah. also get into what I could see as uh, possible challenges for the project, just to ask you about them. Mm -hmm. One thing you already yeah. mentioned yourself a little bit is in terms of uh, the legal framework. So, for example, mm -hmm. like I'm wondering if you faced any like legislative issues in Kenya regarding your project or if the financial system sort of just embraces it or how does that work? Well, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, early on, they threw us in jail when we started doing these projects. <laughs> they did? And, um, they threw you in jail? We won. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. That was okay. back in 2012. And uh, we went through about six months of court cases and um, we won. And um, and there was a big precedent set by that, at least in Kenya. And uh, that, you know, there there's nothing illegal about such systems. And, and to make them illegal is basically to make promissory notes or IOUs or vouchers illegal. And so, you know, what is the regulation on, you know, um, an, an invoice, for instance, and it's covered under, um, usually it's, it's under contract law, right? So you're creating a contract, it's an IOU between an issuer and a holder, it's a bilateral agreement. Um, if that holder wants to trade it onto someone else, that's perfectly legal as well. So, um, setting up frameworks around that um, we've been working a lot with chris cook as well and he's he's designed a lot of legal frameworks um that he calls um um non non-dominium um to make sure that there's no you don't have to create organizations around these things that that you can create networks of service agreements between them um so what we've done is kind of uh, using a lot of his work and with his help i created a economic commons framework um, and an open license or an opt-in license. So you can say, we as an association of people are opting into this license and under this license, we're creating instruments. So a voucher is a type of instrument. There could be other kinds of instruments too. They don't just have to be vouchers. Um, for instance, you could have certi certi certificates, you could have equities. There's different types of instruments that are, that are possible. And then you have agreements between all the parties. So you could have service providers. So that's, you know, grassroots economics right now is acting as a service provider um, under this framework. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we've done a lot of work and, and had a lot of lawyers um, do legal due diligence in different countries and, and Kenya and whatnot. And so far, you know, vouchers stand uh, strong and there's it's, it would be very, very hard for a country to make such an instrument illegal. Um, there are attempts to regulate in different ways, like you can have regulation under payment service provider licenses if you are acting as a facilitator of trade in any way. Um, and there's other types of licenses that are possible if you're going to do any type of an exchange for fiat or national currency. Can, there's exchange licenses and all kinds of stuff. So there's there's fairly clear licensor, licenses and regulations in countries around these types of instruments that are... Um, for the most part, it is just a voucher under contract law, just like creating an, an, an invoice. If you're going to help facilitate 
networks of these. There's there's potentially other licenses you need. If you're a nonprofit, um, which is what we are, it things also become easy because we are not charging anything for these. So if we were, then we might have to go into other types of licenses uh, around them as well. So um, there's a certain benefit to being a nonprofit um, in this in this space as well. Um, but I think you know the regulatory and compliance uh, world is is uh, you know is a deadly thing and it yeah. you know it's navigable but i think this is something that you know the the community currency world needs to really um dig in on and uh you know help create um and preempt a lot of problems that can happen and so this is one of the reasons that we're really getting very deeply into certification processes so when if a community is is creating one of these instruments and they want to be listed on an exchange or our interfaces, we want to make sure that they are following certain um, standards. Like you're not going to create 5 trillion picky picky or motorcycle vouchers, right? Without yeah. proper certification or someone to, to witness that. And, and there's certain, you know, there's a legal obligation there. And so that's been, you know, I, the criticism of the crypto world is that, you know, some guy makes a white paper and makes a trillion tokens and starts selling those without really any obligation behind it whatsoever. And, and you know, the same with fiat instruments, right? Like the, the government will over issue vouchers without clearly stating what's behind them in any way. Um, and, uh, and that's what we're trying to see, see end, you know, in a way we're starting to say, well, well, can we create a whole economy and ecosystem of vouchers and you know trust-based instruments that can connect to each other and create this layer of economic service um, that's based on real value and, and real um, services yeah. yeah that's awesome interesting and i'm glad you guys figured it out uh, but anyway another thing was like i get how when you have these new currencies or sorry vouchers i guess we should call them vouchers maybe um but when you have these like you have the suppliers of goods and services and they can like exchange these vouchers, right? But yeah. what if yeah. someone maybe works as a policeman or a nurse or like something for the government where they don't yeah. really, they don't have a, like a service or a good to exchange. Like they don't have their own voucher that they can kind of exchange for other things. Do they, sure. are they kind of just outside the system? Like, will they just have to stick with the country's native currency or how does that kind of work? I mean, just, you know, imagine it again as a voucher. So if, if you buy a bus ticket, you are holding a voucher for a bus ride, right? If you buy airtime credit, you're holding a voucher for airtime credit. You you weren't an issuer of those vouchers, but you're still using them, right? So the public yeah. using any voucher is totally normal and we do it all the time already. So if we, if we just you know, like imagine ourselves in that space that we're surrounded by actual different credit types of instruments that we are accepting and using. Well, then that's fine. You know, if the if the policeman wants to maybe when he's off duty, do some service for a community group and he'll receive some vouchers for that, that's fine. Maybe he he can also be part of creating a voucher that is based on some other services he's doing that's outside of his his normal salary. But I would also say that governments creating vouchers for services is not uncommon and it's starting to get more and more regular. So for instance, in Italy, creating a voucher redeemable for a tax credit, right? That wouldn't be my favorite in the world, <laughs> but that's an example of a tradable credit. In and, um, but but uh, energy credits, for instance, um, you know, the, the, the Kenya Power and Lighting Company creates tokens right now in kenya these are vouchers redeemable for kilowatt hours right and it's yeah. and it's you know it's essentially a parastatal organization with the government those could be tradable there's nothing wrong or against that right so for a government to go in and say yeah we're going to make a tradable voucher redeemable for, for a service that would be amazing and wonderful and so we want to encourage governments to do things like this and and another piece around this that's very important is the taxation bit and that one thing that, that really the smart contracts we use on the blockchain, the, the only element, the, the really key elements that we've added for these vouchers is the ability for there to be taxation in the form of a Gessel tax, which is, which is a redirected demurrage, right? So the issuers in this case get to 
get to choose where that's going. There can be voting, in fact, on where where those taxes go. Um, those could, in, in some cases, in uh, Kitui, for instance, where we the community is directing those toward the government. They're paying local authorities a bit of tax to help support the mediation processes and auditing processes for their groups. So it's already starting to happen. So seeing this as a way for a government to accept taxation. Now, of course, that these are taxation in a voucher that's yeah. only usable back in that village or at least guaranteed there. So creating marketplaces where these vouchers can be, you know, they, there can be exchanges and to hold vouchers as, a, you know, a co-vestible or investable asset or a digital asset. I think that's also really an exciting space as well. So if we if we want impact investors and we want, um, you know, donors that don't want to donate anymore and they want to be investors, well, can they hold vouchers as a form of investment and then connect those into local markets? Maybe, you know, uh, maybe the government needs to buy some of them, for instance, or there's other markets that need to be created that connect different vouchers together. And so this is where the blockchain DeFi space, decentralized finance, is very exciting because there's a whole bunch, there's this whole host of different types of instruments that have been created to connect different credit objects or different digital assets together. And generally these are called liquidity pools, but oh. there's there's a you know there's a huge parameter space in the creation of those. So having a network that connects millions of vouchers seamlessly with with pathing, right? If A to B connects to C, then A to C automatically has a connection. Um, that's it's already been created. I mean, not that it's you know it's the end all be all, but there are, you know, right now billions to trillions of dollars being of vouchers being moved around. I wouldn't call most of them good vouchers. And so that's why we want to have certification to say, you know, like, okay, yeah, there's actual tomatoes behind that one yeah. um, there. But I, I, I'm really excited about the DeFi space. So building, you know, derivative and, you know, financial market instruments around vouchers and, and you know, trust-based legal credit obligations to me is a really powerful thing. Um, there's a lot more in terms of like certification and other types of what people might call a community currency where they're just like injecting a UBI that has no real legal backing behind it. Um, we've done a bit of those types of programs as well. We call those certificates, right? So if I'm just going to create and make up a, a digital object and I just give it to you, that would be some kind of certification, right? Certification that you're a human or certification that you're cleaning up beaches or that you're planting trees. These are more like points, right? Like they're not they're not bilateral instruments and those are also fine in their own way. Um, and so that's why we have three different types of instruments. And we're also, you know, like a DAO for instance, as well as another type of an instrument, uh, which we're calling more of an equity, right? That's a percentage share type of an instrument. Um, so th there's a lot there on our on our docs page. You can see it here, docs.grasshecon.org slash commons. And you'll see different types of definitions of legal instruments that we're working on. Um, we've got a Discord channel as well right now where we're working on um, building an equity instrument, with like a, a, a more typical type of a DAO. Um, uh -huh. It looks yeah. a little bit like this. So there, there's DAI contrib contributed to a, a community pool. There's voting tokens on that. So these are really equity kind of tokens. These are to vote on supporting liquidity pools of CICs or, or community currencies, right? So here's your community currency being created, backed by services on the left, right? Here's the creation of a connection and investment into the services backing that community currency. So connecting commodity economy type instruments, right, and equities into trust economy based, you know, service backing. Um, cert certificates are a big piece of this as well, right? You know, mm -hmm. so like your your UBI token or your um, other types of tokens that that are not legal credit obligations, but they do tell you something. They do show you some certification. Those are part of all of this as well. So. I think, you know, building together all these kinds of instruments and more um, is really beautiful. And I see a lot of people starting to think and, you know, uh, in this kind of space, more of this kind of, you know, free flowing, like, OK, what are all the parameterizations we can we can come up with? Yeah, that makes sense. And thanks for clearing that up. Actually, I'm glad you brought up DAOs because that's kind of the last thing I wanted to ask you about, because hearing you talk, I see a lot of similarities to DAOs. Uh, especially you also mentioned like voting within the communities. So just like for mm -hmm. the futuristic vision of this project, do you like, maybe yeah. it's already how it is, but do you feel like eventually the communities themselves 
should be able to fully take control of the projects and kind of be able to shape different futures within the different villages of how it's going to like uh, how the evolution is going to be of it or how do you like to see the future i mean if that I, makes sense that was a bit of a cryptic yeah, question <laughs> I mean, I would say the communities do have complete control. And I mean, the way I mean, here's here's the way it works right now. So there's a bunch of issuers. This would be like 30 women in the village. They come up with their services that are backing the CIC and they create a legal binding right between yeah. their CIC supply. Right. They they vote on everything in this case. Right. So like what is the supply? What is backing it? Who's involved? Uh, is there a demurrage? Is there a community fund? Who's holding the community fund? Uh, how is the community fund voted on? All this stuff. So um, <clears throat> typically we have something like a 2% demurrage here that goes into a community fund, right? They The community votes on what to do with that community fund, right? Based on proposals. That right now in village groups is done with raising of hands, right? So we don't have a really robust sort of DAO-like instruments on chain for this, but that's something that we're hoping to build. Um, and on, on this other side, in terms of, um, you know, this is this is a fund full of die, right? With people who put die into this, have a vote on what to do with it. It's, it's very similar in some ways to this, right? Um, so you can call this thing on the left a DAO. There's no reason why you wouldn't. Um, it's just a DAO that instead of putting die in, you're putting legal credit obligations, okay? Not everyone has die, and we don't want to force people into, you know, using the US the DAI is, is stable coin against the US dollar, right? So we yeah. obviously don't, we don't, we don't even want to promote DAI. We, we see this as a divestment tool, right? We're divesting from this commodity economy into the trust and service economy over here, right? So this is a DAO by itself. It's already a DAO. People are already, you know, doing these voting processes. Ideally in the future, we have more sexy and better interfaces so that all the voting processes can be on chain um, but right now they're done by raise of hands and that's fine. Um, in terms of running the technology behind all of this themselves, I mean, you know, doing it on paper is also possible, like what we've done in the past, right? Where we had a demurrage with a stamp script, um, but doing it technically locally, what we're doing is setting up mesh networks for that. So if a community wants to run all of their own tech, we're working with, um, David Johnson from South Africa, who has a program called Ineti. And so the entire ledger and everything can be run locally completely. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's really interesting to talk about distributed ledgers and distributed local mesh networks as service in, service provision, because there's another CIC that's created to run that as well. Right. It's, it's just another service, right? It's, a, you know, so the internet is a service, the blockchain is a service, they're all services that can fit within this framework. Now we want to support this, right? We want more and more connected, uh, communities based on on this and we want to have a way for this type of economy to connect into that economy and support it and so this is another DAO right another DAO another type of DAO in which you know you've put in US dollars here I mean this is very similar to a company right if you had a holding fund for a company right and you have shareholders who put in the money you could have sweat equity you know holders as well it doesn't just have to be DAI contributors they're voting on proposals right to to send their die into connecting that to this community currency so this is a way where now the cic holders can actually get some of this die out they can build up their services increase their total supply right and at the same time there's a market being created here between die and the cic um and and that can be lucrative as well right so there's an investment here on this side to say we're going to create this liquidity pool and as people put CIC in and pull die out, they take a, a small percentage of that. So, you know, in order to put their risk, because this is a risky thing for them to do, they want to be pretty sure that that's a good CIC that people are going to need and that people are, are going to put more die back in to this pool to get some of that CIC as well. So they're creating an exchange, a marketplace between die and CIC. It doesn't have to be just die and CIC, right? This could be any CIC to any yeah. CIC. And so, you know, using die as in a way as like a network token. Um, is what's going on here and um, yeah I don't know if that makes sense but yeah yeah that does make sense it's pretty interesting and it's I guess it's kind of a, an infrastructure if you could say so that you can keep developing on enlarging or copying in different areas right yeah yeah, yeah. exactly exactly Thanks so this, so this ought to be world 
this 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 DAO is is a global DAO to support these types of systems all over the world. And and yeah. you know, grassroots economics foundation doesn't have to be part of it. Um, we're just there to help create the standards around it, um, and and you know, help on the tech as well. That's really awesome, Will. Uh, thank you so much for coming to this interview. I'll make sure to put your Discord and socials and website etc. Uh, in the YouTube description. But it was really nice talking okay. to you. Okay, thanks, Anton. Thanks for Thank having me. Thank you so much. Bye.